All right. Welcome. Uh, we're here at Sustainable U. Charlie Moore here. I am honored to bring on our guest today. Um, his stage name is Black Alex. He is a phenomenal um, hip hop rapper. Uh, what would you say? Rapper? I would say more rap, right? Than hip hop? Yeah. yeah. So he's a phenomenal rapper. Um, I love it. And it's you can hear his message. He's got a beautiful message through his tone. You hear every single word. I appreciate that greatly. I think that's a piece that we're missing a lot in today's uh, in today's genre of music. And that's why it's an honor to bring him on because I want to help turn this guy into a superstar because I think everyone needs to hear his voice right now. So, <laughs> so Al Alex, welcome and thank you for joining us, man. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks, so. Yeah, cool, man. So welcome to Kush, keeping us sustainably healthy. So on every episode, I will jump into it. Sustainability. Everyone thinks of just ecological. Everyone thinks about just planting trees. Sustainability. Sustainability means a lot. Um, and in this particular instance, it's a matter of supporting your local artists. You know, it's supporting your local talents and then helping them to drive and, and get forward. And, you know, maybe because maybe you didn't just hear of them on, you know, your radio on the big radio stations doesn't mean you shouldn't give them a chance to listen to and grow with them and and support them uh, and support them by sharing their stuff and getting others to hear of it. You know, it's not a matter of just listening, become a voice for them. So that's why um, I'm, I, it, I'm, I'm really excited to do this with uh, a phenomenal entertainer tonight. Um, I've been listening to his album, really stoked about it. There's two songs I'm going to jump into with this. So Alex, what do you want to say to this Kush audience, man? Um, well, if, if the sustainability is the uh, topic at hand, I definitely have some, um, some views on that that I've developed over the years. Um, and I, I like how you guys are pointing out the fact that it's beyond ecological because, um, you know, we tend to we tend to tie words into certain things and like a, a concept can help us in another area, but we just don't make that connection because we're normally connecting it to something else, you know. So even if you're not like ecologically uh, conscious, mm -hmm. sustainability is something you can definitely um, employ as a part of your life. And I, I try to do it as much as possible in any small way. So, uh, yeah. I love that. And we're going to jump hard into that because I want to know, we, you know, we let's tell the world who Alex is on this, on this call, you know, that's what the, all this chat, you know, let's tell the world of who you are, why you are, what you're doing, what drives you. And especially during these times, man. So I'm going to hit you up with some, with some questions and we'll jump into some fun stuff, man. All right, cool. Cool. Uh, yeah. So jump in, man. Bio. Who's Alex? Um, I mean, I'm me as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, people who but, don't know who you are, who's Alex? Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I've been a musician. Um, well, I've been active in the music business since I was 20 years old. I just turned 34. I was a drummer for a long time, played in many bands, most of which I started on my own. And my last band was a band called Nonstop to Cairo. Nice. Uh, they're my brothers. I mean, everyone I've ever played music with is a brother, and I've learned from them, or a sister, and I've learned from them. And I, right now I'm at a point where I'm trying to apply everything that I've learned uh, in my music. And so um, maybe I should back up a little bit. Before I actually started playing actively in bands, I went to audio engineering school. Oh, what so, school? Uh, uh, REI in Islandia. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, shout out to Matt and JJ and all of those guys. <laughs> but yeah, I learned that skill there and uh, paid my own money, you know, cash to just do it because it just seemed like a way better option for me than college, you know, because mm -hmm. um, I could just focus on the one thing that I really loved instead of having to worry about the other stuff. And that's just, that was just kind of my personal view on it. Um, but and but and that also kind of ties into the sustainability thing, too. Huh. Okay, you know that's a little. Uh, you know, I'll explain that a little later, I guess. But um, yeah. Then I then I started starting doing bands, play drums. Then I got to a point where I wanted to do my own thing, and that's where I am now. And um, you know, the music I'm putting out now, I guess. Uh, you know, Jay Z has a quote where he said, "Reasonable doubt." His first album is the album it took him his whole life to make. Yeah. So this is the music that it's taken me my whole life to make that that I'm that I'm putting out right now. So what genre were you before? Um, multiple genres. I did. I was in a rock surf rock band. I was in a 
Non Stop to Carl is obviously like a ska, hip hop, funk band. Yeah. Uh, hip hop, rock. I've been in cover bands. I've been done reggae. I mean, I, I used to play. I used to play a lot of genres. You know, probably the only genre I never really touched on was metal and jazz. Okay. Um, yeah, I've been around. That's cool. I'm surprised you didn't touch metal because I know a lot of drummers like to try to get into that. You just to mess around with it, you know. Well, I mean, I would play heavy music. I couldn't say, I can't say I would play metal in the sense that I'm thinking about it. Like when I think of uh, like math metal and the, the crazy double bass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I never did that. But I, yeah, I, I mean, I've played heavy music before, you know. That's uh, cool. So fast forward, why, why rap? I've always wanted to be a rapper, man. Like I remember I was a freshman in high school and Ghostface Killer was my favorite artist. And I would like be in the back of Spanish class, like, trying to write raps like Ghostface, like not realizing that he's talking like street code, you know, mm -hmm. just like a young kid. And I'm trying to write raps about like chocolate strawberries and vanilla pudding <laughs> so I could sound funky and fresh. Um, and then like whenever I would get stuck though with writing, I would get really discouraged. And mm. um, so I, saw, I started looking at instruments, you know, and then I would look at the keyboard, I looked at the guitar and ultimately settled on the drums. But the desire to rap was always there, you know, like I was always starting bands with rappers. I was always producing rappers, like talking to rappers. I would actually be like kind of envious of rappers. Like, man, you guys just kind of like, like I got to carry all these drums to a show and you guys got to go in the studio. Show up. <laughs> yeah, you can show up or you can just have a little mic in your room and you can make uh -huh. a record. So I always just think that was cool. Um, you know, uh, that also aligns with sustainability um, from my point of view. But, um, yeah, so it's something I wanted to do for a long time. You know what I mean? And, and like I said, I was saying before we kind of officially went on air, I feel like hip hop is like the perfect music to take an amalgamation of influences and make them accessible. You know, in the same hip hop record, you can have a metal influence, a jazz influence, a soul influence, and then you can rap on top of it. Yes. You know, and you can tell a story. And I think it's a more challenging way to write because there's so many words you have to use to complete a verse. Um, and then I, I like the solo aspect. I don't know if it's because I'm an Aries or whatever, but I like to do when I want to do, when I'm ready. And it was great learning how to compromise and work with the team. But, you know, after 14 years, I think it's like my hunches are very important to me, and I like to just be able to. You execute. have to. Your body tells you. Your heart tells you where you need to go. Yeah. You know, and that uh, amalgamation that you were talking about, I mean, for me, the, I think, I don't know. I, I'm sure there might have been something earlier, but the earliest mix of that rock rap was with. Um, do you remember the Aerosmith and uh, Run DMC? Yeah, yeah. It was Run DMC, right? Walk this way. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it just exploded, and it's like it created a whole new genre of a voice. And and what I what I loved about it is it brought many multiple audiences together, and opening their eyes to like, wow, you know, like new genre, and this could work. You know, you know, it's funny. I think I, I mean, rap's not the only genre that does that or hip hop, but like it definitely, I think, does it the best. You know what I mean? Where you get two different genres and yep. they can come together and either make music or enjoy music because a lot of metal guys love like rappers like Immortal Technique, Conscious mm -hmm. Rappers, Nas, guys like that. You know, they're into that, you know, but the metal guys are also into jazz and the jazz guys are into Kendrick. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, you know I mean? like so it's just like you just it brings things together man and, and and i think i think it was like two years ago it was declared the most popular music in the world i don't know if it still stands but that was inevitable in my opinion you know what I mean? oh it's yeah crazy. i mean the, the the entire genre has exploded throughout you uh throughout asia you yes. know it, and it's like taking over Asia. I mean, it's amazing. You know, it's, uh, I mean, shoot, what was it? Five years ago, we had Gangnam Style come out and that was like their big hit hip hop, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, hip hop's been, hip hop's been borrowing uh, from Asian street fashion for a long time. Yes. You know? Yeah. So that's another harmonious connection. So I want you to jump into, let's jump into the sustainability, Alex, you know, give yeah. us, Give us like, what are your, and the reason I'm jumping into this is, and this is for everyone who's listening in is we all have to, and, I, and I'm sure you'll agree with me. And if you disagree with me, with me, this is awesome because, you know, we could even just debate this, but sure. we all have a personal responsibility to ensure our perception and consciousness of how we approach things in life 
to just make sure that we're doing the least amount of damage as possible to what we're doing in life as a whole. So, so Alex, as a musician and as an influencer, and you have your audience, you have your followers, you know, talk to them right now. Like what are the things that Alex does and, and creates to be and living sustainably? And how, what's that perception that keeps you balanced? You know, especially during these times of COVID, because I mean, I think we've really, every individual has had to push their limits of a new comfort zone of what may become now a new societal norm now. You know, walking around with masks and, you know, social distancing and, and the whole. So how, how have you adjusted to this and what is your sustainability piece to this? Um, I mean, in general, I think my journey into a more sustainable way of thinking um, centers around minimalism. Nice. You know? I like that. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I OK, so like I've been doing music for like 14 years and the goal with a lot of musicians and it varies depending on the musician, but fame is like the goal, right? Um, or at least enough fame to keep working because that's very important. In pursuit of that, there are a lot of webs that can be weaved um, into your mentality. Some of them are self-imposed and a lot of them are imposed internally or externally. Um, so I think over the years I've tried to find, I've tried to find the, um, the 20% that makes the 80%. Nice. You know yeah, yeah. Yes. I don't know if you know the 80-20 rule. I do, I do. Go into it deeper, though, as people who are listening. You know, okay. like so yeah. the 80-20 principle essentially loosely states that like 80% of any situation is most influenced by 20% of that situation. So um in terms of recording music, right? Uh we were talking I was talking with Steve about gear earlier. And I right now, okay, so I have this microphone, it's a hundred fifty dollar mic. I this could be a thousand dollar mic, right? Um but the idea is this mic is going to record my voice mm -hmm. and I'm going to be able to mix it, make it sound great. That's the 20% that matters the most. Is my voice going to sound great? Okay, that's going to that's going to give you 80% of your results. The other 80% that's not as important is the way it looks. Yes. How much it costs, uh -huh. the industry standard, it, are people going to think I'm cool cuz I use it? You know what I'm saying? Like is it the latest it. upgrade? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like these are the things that you can kind of, and and it might take time to settle into an idea like this because it's kind of radical to people, but these are the things that you can dismiss, and at times they can help you make a lot more progress because they create a more sustainable environment. You know, if I'm only if I only got to get a mic that sounds good, and that's the bottom line, then I don't have I can my budget becomes way more open. You know, so now I can get a mic and an interface and maybe some software as opposed to spending it all on the mic. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know if I explained that like super effective, but like, I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. Yes. No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So how is it? So when you're, especially now with COVID, all right. I mean, live performances have been all but almost mitigated completely. It's been bizarre. I mean, I just saw you did a live performance this past Sunday with uh, Paul Byers. Yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. I watched awesome. that. You're dope, dude. You're awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was actually supposed to be there, but I, my, I, I was hosting family over the weekend. So okay. my, my wife would have killed me if I, uh, if I left her to do that all solo by herself but <laughs> with the four kids. But um, so as an artist now, what are these new changes that you're going through? And, you know, and now not just speaking to the regular general audience, it's in England, but also to other artists. What are you doing that's creative and keeping yourself, you know, paced ahead but also, you know, proactive and in a positive mindset that you're not feeling demoralized with the present conditions. Because I think that's the most, you know, sadly, you know, I'll bring this up on the on this is I lost a very dear friend this morning. Young, 41 years old, had a heart attack. Wow. Sorry to hear that, man. And I think it was a, due to a lot of the stresses of the present conditions, you know, that compounded into the in to just the realignments and the, and trying to become as malleable as you can to move and to, to reposition yourself in, in today's times. Yeah. What, what are you doing as, to keep your morale high, to keep yourself proactive and, and repositioning in this market? I mean, the number one thing I'm doing is relying on my family a lot, you know, um, like, right. Like that's just important. You know what I mean? Um, because, you know, obviously, like, social, being social is a big part of our lives, and that got taken away. Mm -hmm. 
we can still connect on Zoom and we can still connect online. But as far as in a face-to-face interaction, for the most part during quarantine, it was my family that I was able to have access to the most. Yeah. So I really tried to strengthen my relationships with them um, because they're always going to be honest with me and they're always going to do whatever needs to happen for me to be safe and, you know, happy. So that's like my number one strategy, I guess, for handling the anxiety. I'm going to jump in with that number one. I want you to continue. But isn't it such a blessing how I feel that that this pandemic has created a stronger family communication again? You know, something that I feel that we took for granted that our family was just that phone call away or that car ride away. And it became separated to where it wasn't anymore. And it was, it was, yeah, it was always that phone call, but now it's like, you're always checking in and on each other. And I see more of that family bonding happening as well. Yeah. So I just want to throw that in there because I'm, I noticed that I see that as almost a blessing from this. Yeah, man, it's two sides to every coin, right? So yeah, it's like as bad as it is. And, and, you know, obviously the quarantine in a way, like if you were able to actually not work, and be okay, I, I, I recognize that as like a blessing, right? So mm-hmm. not everyone's in the same situation and not everyone has a family that they can rely on. Some people are stuck with their families during yeah. the time. So sure. I did that and like, but um, yeah, you're right, man. It's like in the darkness, it's like we find other ways to sort of fulfill ourselves and where we might've gone out networked or gone to shows. Now it's like, well, let me connect with my mom. Let me connect with my brother. Let me do that. You yeah. Know? And that's good because, um, you know, you hear that rhetoric a lot that like the family's been dismantled and, you know, we have we have to focus on family. That's the future. And this gives us the opportunity to do that. So it's kind of like a cleansing in that sense. You know, yes. Yeah. We, we see a very eye to eye with that. Exactly. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And, that, and that's funny. I didn't even look at it that way initially. I just saw several people on my friends list on Facebook talking that way. And it kind of got me appreciating it more, too. You know, Um but it's in, my my situation with the whole quarantine is interesting as an artist because I think I've I've been prepped for a situation like this for a long time. Oh, really? Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, like like I said, I, I've been playing in bands since I was twenty, right? So that's me as a drummer. Uh, collaboration was absolutely necessary as a drummer, yeah. Yeah. right? But then I shift in the rap, and I'm doing this. You know, I can I can make music. I can write on my phone, and I can record in my room and. All I need is a laptop. I mean, I could work outside if I want, if it's nice enough. Yeah. So the live element being taken away, I mean, for me, I, I mean, I, it's not like I make my living that way. You know, I, I own, I have businesses that I make money with. So it was fine for me, you know. Um, I can't, so I couldn't give anyone advice on, on how to like um, supplement their income in that sense or how to cope with that because I can't really relate on that level. But I have been able to create constantly. And during that four months, that free time, it was like, I was like, oh, this is what it would be like, huh? Like, <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> and if I just had nothing but time, you know, and I have all these different disciplines now. I have audio engineering, I do graphic art, I do video editing, and I do music. So it was like, all right, cool. So I just started dropping whatever I wanted. Like, you know, whatever I wanted to drop, I just started dropping it just to keep that just to keep my presence out there and to keep yeah. my activity going. You know, if I got the opportunity to do Zoom performance or some poetry or something like that, I would do it, you know? Um, most of the artists I know, by the way, are doing these things already, you know? And, uh, but that that's kind of what helped me get through it as a creative person, you know? Um, as far as supplementing income and stuff, I mean, everyone's different. Everyone's like, situation's different. Yeah. Um, so I don't know exactly what kind of advice I could give. No, but that first line of advice was great because the consistency that I heard is just, just keep moving, keep creating. Right. You know, when you have that time, you know, the way I see it, see things in life personally is that you can look at things either good or bad. All right. Like you could either dive into that. And then to be honest, I really feel there's no gray, gray area, you know, like no middle ground, you know, okay. it's either good or bad. It's like, you could be positive about it and say, you know what? This is a great opportunity for me. I it's minimized my travel for business. Hmm. To me, I was like, this is great. This is a recalibration. Let's look at what we're doing. And we're so malleable to, to, to sculpt our way into where we should be going that it gave it, it, it took away that rigidity of what we were dealing with before 
and now is allowing us to get creative right. and barely watch TV. My head is always thinking, building strategies, building approaches, and it's consistent to what you're saying. It's given you that, that opportunity to create, to be, to really deep dive deep inside of you and to bring out what your, what your potential is. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think, um, I think I would agree with that on, on a certain level. I think depending on the situation, it's easier for me to accept that things are either good or bad. But like, and I don't know if this is the right way to think about it or if my thinking will evolve. It likely will as it does. But I love the gray area. You know? Oh, do you? Okay. I can't. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, I, like, I like thrive in the gray area. Like, in fact, I feel like I'm tr I'm constantly campaigning for more people, <laughs> you know, to join me in like reconciling difficulty and ease, or reconciling good and bad, or reconciling whatever ah. like negative positive. You know, like I, I like to um like ego, for example. You know, yeah. Like, my ego has put me in some of the worst places in my life, uh, with in my relationships with people or in whatever situation. But it's like. At the same time, I was like, man, where would I be without my ego? Like, I would be like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And not ego in the sense of, like, dominating anyone, but ego in the sense of just, like, before I try to do something, kind of, like, I think I could do that. You know what I mean? Like, I like rapping, like I said, when I was younger, I used to get really discouraged, and I used to, like, not do it. But all throughout the years, even though I was struggling with a lot of self-esteem stuff, I always had this feeling in the back of my mind. I was like, yo, if I got just like six months to work on some raps, I know I could make some raps that would connect with people. Like, I know that, you know what I mean? And not having done it, it might seem egotistical to say. Yeah. Like, what makes you think you could rap? You know, I even would talk to some of my rap friends. I talked to one of my friends. I'm not going to say his name. <laughs> but I, I, this is my boy. I love him to death. But um, And I don't even know if he remembers this conversation. But I first told him I was thinking about rap in like 2014. And he kind of put fear in me, not on purpose, but he was kind of like, all right, I, I mean, if you think so, okay. I mean, like, yeah. oh, it's not as easy as it looks. Yeah. I'm sure to him in that moment, it might have seemed egotistical for me to be saying, no, I think I could do that, you know? But at the same time, that's the thing that drove me to do it, you know, and drove me to actually follow through. Now, obviously, there's a dark side to ego, which is like when I'm, you know, um, inconsiderate of people or I, I let that vision go a little too far. You know what I mean? So that's just like one example of why I think the gray area has value, you know, or even in the state of the world right now, or let's say, let's look at COVID, right? Like COVID, yeah. I think we're finding out more and more that it's not a black and white situation, you know, like um, whether it be, whether you can, you know, subscribe to conspiracy theories, I'm going to leave that off the table, but we were ready to open up, right? And we felt like, okay, we're going to start phasing this thing in. Seems like we have it under control. Then new cases start springing up all over the place, you know? Or when the quarantine first happened. It's like, for me, quarantine was kind of lit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it was great. <laughs> but for other people, friends I know who I would talk to, it was a struggle for them. Yeah. Because maybe they lived alone. You know what I mean? Like, I, I never even had to consider that, right? So it's not it's not necessarily a black and white thing. Not that I, not that I disagree with looking at it that way sometimes, because I think that is necessary sometimes to just block out the negative because it's just not useful. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a gray area, man. <laughs> I'm a great, I'm, I'm a great. I like, <laughs> I like this. This is cool because you're the first person that's come like that's Set, you know, stating that that gray area is a cool area and justifying a really good reason as to why it's a good area. And that's what's really cool about this. I'm, I'm really enjoying this conversation right now. Thank you. Bro. So, so with this, let's, uh, so this whole gray area thing, and I, and I bet, you know, what's so cool, man, is like everyone who's going to be listening in, they're going to, they're going to hear these two sides of this. And they, they're, they may likely be like, you know what? Cool. This gray area is the spot that, I feel as well. And it's okay to be here. You know, that's the whole point of this is now we have to, we have a voice. All right. And I'm sick and tired of all this. And yeah, I'm going to point at Hollywood, all this Hollywood celebrity banter of the people that play fictional characters that have so much voice and power in society. And all of a sudden we see all of our social engagement 
just saturated with all this white noise of distraction that's not creating any solutionary, uh, you know, solutionary causes, sure. uh, bringing people together. And it's like, how many more times? Yeah, fine. I've seen those videos of those guys, you know, falling off their stupid icy conditions. Yeah, that's funny. But how much is that going to consume my life? You know, and it's trying to get this type of this type of education out there to the people like, you know, let's start critically thinking. Let's start philosophy, you know, using philosophy. Like let's go into our minds and evaluate ourselves, do self-evaluation and look at the flaws. What, where am I failing myself? I like to ask everybody, if you met yourself, if you were a child, you know, put yourself in this shoe. Okay. And I'll ask you this question. I'll ask you, take your eight year old version of you. Okay. Okay. Innocent. Okay. If you met yourself today, would you be your own hero? Hmm. Hmm. Now, I mean, what, what is, is my perception that of an eight year old as well? Yeah. Of you, of you as an eight year old, if you met yourself, would you, would you consider yourself like a cool dude that you just wanted to be like, wow, you know, like, you know, I, I would say un, in, uh, indubitably. Yes. <laughs> yeah. See, and that's a question though. That's a question I like to ask everybody because there, you know, it's a way for people to re- to like have that self reflection of, you know, what I haven't been following my dreams. I haven't been following my passion. You know. Yeah. And uh, and and that that's how I like to live because I like to live putting myself back in my mind of when I was a kid. You know, who did I always dream to be? And now that I have four kids. Who, what role model do I want to be of my children? You know, what's that legacy that I want them to see and live by and see me do by and sacrifice by, you know? So that's awesome. Good. I'm glad you said yes, man. That is awesome. That's that's a nice way to look at it though. I never actually thought about that because, you know, like when you get, when you become an adult and this is why I asked if my perception is that of an eight year old, because when you look at, when you're an adult and you're aware of all the nuances of your situation, um, depending on how you let it affect you, it can be discouraging. I, I'll speak for myself, you know what I mean? Because I've struggled with um, self-image my entire life. Huh. That's right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, man. Right. There's, a lot, there's, a lot, there's a lot of experiences that are motivating those songs that you heard from my album, you know? Okay, yeah. So, but when you're in the thick of it as an adult, it's kind of hard to clearly see how well you're doing on something you know what i mean so like you want to be a role model for your kids i mean i'm sure they see you that way already they am sure they see you as like this giant who's just like un- impenetrable you know um hopefully <laughs> i mean they're, they're growing up so they're gonna have like they're gonna start developing their own ideas of what's cool and you know i know my nieces are starting to find me a little less cool these days but <laughs> you know for a while there i had them but it's like I, I guess I guess what I'm saying is that the the scope of a child, like the innocence, can kind of, or if you try to look at yourself that way, just pure. Yeah. You know, it's like you know what I'm doing much better than I thought because I know because you know I, I think I'm following my passions more than I ever have, but there's a lot of things that I'm I'm still uh, I'm just not taking serious enough, and I'm just not pursuing it enough. You know, like my health has always been a thing that it's always been one of the most important things to me. You know what I mean? Like. I'm the kind of guy that literally, like, I'll be in my backyard chilling, and I'll be looking at a tree, and I'll be thinking, like, man, I wish I could climb that tree. Like, I wish I was in good enough shape to climb that tree, or like run down the block, or like do a performance and like spit like Busta Rhymes and not be tired, like type thing. <laughs> but I still won't go to the gym that day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, really? Okay. Why? Yeah, like, What's that piece? What say that again? What's that piece that's blocking you? Man, I think it's laziness, bro. I think it's laziness and it's just like overthinking. You know what I mean? Because the gym is one of those things where it's like, you know, just thinking about doing it is way harder than doing it. Like, you know, going to the gym is like the hardest thought. But then once you get in there, you're like, wait, why do I why do I stop for myself from coming here? I love this. This feels great. You know what I mean? Um, but at the honest, if I'm being honest, that's what I think it is, right? And so I know that there's still that um capacity for procrastination inside of me. So there's still things that I want to reach and achieve. And I might judge myself on those things often. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, great, great song you just made, but you still ain't go to the gym today. So you're really not doing it like that. Like you think you are. 
kind of thing. And uh, that's just that's a good thought, though, because you know what? That's that's you being honest to you to you. You if know, it stays at a, if it stays at a certain if it stays in the gray area, right? Like if we don't move it over to the black, and it becomes yeah. negative, yeah. Or, yeah. If stays, or if we don't keep it in the white, it's, and it's, it's, it's like not, okay, not to go to the gym. <laughs> like, it was like okay, no, just forgive yourself. You didn't go. That's fine. That's like the white. And the black is like you're so you didn't go. That's like you know what I'm saying. The gray is like you know it's good that you recognize you didn't go, but now you got to go. Yeah, I like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This is why. Uh, this is why it's like vote Alex Turner for the Great Party. You know, 2024. <laughs> Dude, I freaking I like that. I'm liking this whole gray zone thing, man. I I'm. It, it, you're waking me up to some thoughts now, man. No, it's funny because this morning, I went running today, peak of day. It was like 94 degrees, or whatever out. I did a five mile run. And after my runs all the time, I jump on my bike. You know, I did 15 miles on my bike. And then I got back. And after all that, I usually jump on my kayak. And then I'll do um, I'll, I'll, I do my pull-up bar. There. I always start with the hardest exercises first. Oh, damn. And I'm looking at this pull-up bar. And I'm like, nah, nah, nah. It's not happening today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I'm like, I'm dying. I can't even breathe right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm not even. And I it's knew. Part of it, like, overwhelms you. Yeah, and I knew if I just grabbed those bars, that muscle wasn't even touched today. Mm. That wouldn't even been it today. And I would have easily been able to bang out those pull-ups. But mentally, mentally and the heat and just dripping, I was like, nah, it ain't happening. Right. <laughs> right. But so, you know, it's like at least you did those first things. You know what I mean? So it's better than not doing anything. So in a situation like that, it's like maybe you legitimately – should have not done the pull-ups today. Like maybe you legitimately needed that break, right? And if the topic of conversation is sustainability, then not burning ourselves out is super cool. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes if you're a man of action or a person of action, sometimes that thought of, of uh, hesitation is important to keep you healthy. You know what I mean? Because I've been that guy too. You know, it's when it comes to fitness, just going way too hard. Way yeah. too days in the gym, like lifting heavy. You know what I mean? It's obviously before I learned certain things. But I'm thinking I got to do that if I'm serious, when really, sometimes the serious thing to do is chill out. Because, like, what, what, are the, what, are the, what are the biggest guys in the gym, with, what would they tell me when they saw me struggling with a weight? It's too heavy. Too heavy, yeah. Your form, your form, right. Your form is more important than yeah. the weight. Keep it sustainable. You know what I'm saying? Like, they would be pointing me in a direction of longevity as opposed to, I'm going to go hard for a month, two months, three months. I'm going to look good for the summer. And then by the winter, I'm going to be back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yep. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to take that time out. You know I appreciate you justifying my lack of doing my pull-ups today. So I mean, you know you feel better than me. You know what I'm, saying? I'm just saying like from the outside, it's like, <laughs> I, I'm, I don't know. You said you kayaked, you ran five miles. I'm like, yeah. Damn, like that seems like a solid day. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that no, that's just my warm up doing the car. You know, I always start with cardio, then I go to circuit, and then I go to to weapon training for about an hour. Oh wow, um, you're smart. Yeah, well, yeah, my nunchucks, man, just rip my nunchucks. Oh, my nunchucks, man. Yeah, you know, I had a pair of nunchucks, some heavy nunchucks. Yeah, right. I was trying to practice. I, I got them like three years ago, and I was practicing for a while. I just got so sick of getting hit in the head, man. <laughs> I was like, I can't do back in the head. Yeah, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like. I got, I got to get proper training. I got to get like light plastic joints or something like that. Like, I'll teach you some stuff, man. I've been doing them over 20 years. It's, it's, uh, oh, you froze there. I'll teach you some cool stuff, man. You want to get, oh, I'm frozen. Am I back? You froze for a second, but you're back. All right, cool, cool, cool. So, all right. So I'm loving this conversation. We're going into all these different tangents. We talk about sustainability and what's important is I hope you're all listening in on we're all individuals doing our own thing, our own drive, our own path, our own dream. But we have to maintain a balance in our own lives. You know, we have to put in that time of work. We have to put in that time of family. We have to put in the time to self, both mentally and physically, to find that balance. And that's what all sustainability is about. And especially as a musician, a big part of it is having that discipline in creating music. You yeah. know, and. and yeah. And putting your heart and soul into that music. Music. So, Alex, I'm going to let you lead in because um, you lead in what, what song you want to talk about first. Because I, I, there's a dude. Your whole album was dope, man. Oh, you want to talk about the album? Yeah, okay. let's jump in, man. And by the way, wait, wait. I just want to jump in real quick. 
if you're cool with this, it's up to you, Alex. All right, it's all you. Yeah. If you're cool with it. I'd like Steve to cue up a clip of one of your songs. If you're cool. If you're not cool, I'll tell him not to. No, of course. Yeah, yeah. Let it rip. All right, you pick the song to have him pull. Get he'll have a clip ready to go. All right, I want you to jump into some music, uh, talking about your music, okay. and then then you give Steve the direction. You get say, Steve, get let it rip, man. All right. Uh, well, well, before we went on air, we were talking about White Black Boy and Sasha Gray. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let, me, let me hit with the. Let me hit you with White Black Boy first. I think that's a little more straightforward. Wait, wait. White black boy, white black boy. I think is is I actually I personally I would love Steve to play a clip of that. Is that cool? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you could do that. All right. So Steve, if you could get white black boy ready to go, um, I think white black boy has a lot more depth to it that we could go deep into mm -hmm. than Sasha Gray. Okay. It's you, you who wrote the song. So you tell me, does Sasha Gray have more depth? Well, I think Sasha Gray like. All right. I mean, I guess I'll just, I don't really know which one has more. We're going to tag her in this video, by the way, because she's got to hear this conversation right now. Say it again. We're going to tag her in this, man. She's got to hear what we're talking about. <laughs> I hope so, man. Shit. Yes. <laughs> Can I first on here? Is this, is that like a, are we keep No, it? you're cool. It doesn't matter. All right, cool. I'm not going to. Yeah, we'll keep it minimal, but you know, just so yeah. it doesn't kill us. But Just in case I slip up, you know. Yeah, it's all good. I slip up all the time. Yeah. But yo, okay, so all right, Sasha Gray on that topic. Okay, so right. there was a season of Entourage, season seven. All right. Where Vince starts dating Sasha Gray. And he's like enthralled with her coolness, you know? And she's super cool in the show. Like she I mean, I don't know if it's, she's like that in real life, but I, I have heard that she's like a like a legitimate artist, like beyond just uh, pornography. So she's a writer and she's a painter and she's all you know, she's all these things, and she's Sasha Gray. And so he starts to become obsessed with her and starts getting into cocaine, which is something that apparently she can handle, but he cannot. Huh. His life starts to fall mm. apart a little bit. Um, and he ends up having to go to rehab by the end of the season. And it's so funny, like Eminem like punches him out at the end of the season, like that's how the season ends. <laughs> well, I guess that's as low as you can get when you're in Hollywood where Eminem's like punching you out in the middle of the fight. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, because that's the message that they said, but um so when I, okay, so like, there's a lot going on with this. I came up with that little chorus. I wake up in the morning and I thank the Lord and I, and I, and I say what up to Sasha Gray. I'm imagining myself as Vince in the show, kind of. Oh, cool. But I'm also taking my own experiences uh, with uh, just meeting different women. Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't had many one night stands. I'm not going to say like I'm on that level, but just different experiences I've had with being, um, just just overtaken with like a woman you know yeah, 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 yeah. Like that. and that's what i'm talking about in the first two verses so i meet her and then we're just and i feel like i'm vince like i'm just like yo this chick is insane it's crazy it's unbelievable like um and then i wrote those two verses but then i got to a point where it's like well i don't want to just write a song about being obsessed with a girl so i decided to turn her into an alien from another planet and that was like <laughs> that she's keeping and by the third oh. verse when I'm like, and, and mind you, I don't know if it comes across clear in a song. I may as well just put it out there. Uh, that Those first two verses happen in one night. That's all one night. Cool. Okay. Okay. Right. So we're chilling at my crib, I guess, or wherever it is. And then she tells me that she's actually from this other planet. And she's been like thinking about getting out of here, but she happened to meet me. And she seems like, I seem like the kind of guy she could fall in love with, but she starts breaking down all these issues that she has with the planet Earth. You know what I mean? It's like the racism, the homophobia, the inequality. Like I, where I come from, this is not even a thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I like you and this is cool, but like, I got to go back. And metaphorically, what I'm trying to get at there is situations I've been in where a woman in my life had to choose her health mm -hmm. over being with me because oh, huh. the relationship was dysfunctional or I was dysfunctional, you know, which I have been many times. So like, her coming to that conclusion that there's something better out there or maybe a past that she wishes she can go back to where things were a lot simpler and things were a lot more pure. Uh, that's kind of what she's implied and tells me in that third verse. And I kind of, I just wanted to put the alien twist on it just so I could say I wrote a one night, a song about a one night stay with an alien really like. <laughs> Sasha Gray, nonetheless, that was awesome. That was, yeah. <laughs> dude, yeah. 
we're, we're I'm gonna do everything I can to get you to meet Sasha Gray, man. And just dude. Yeah, I used to like daydream about having her in the video. Yeah. Know? So let's so let's, Ill. let's do it. Let's we're gonna we're gonna try to put these puzzle pieces together to make this happen, man. All right. Well, hopefully I flatter her, flattered her enough in the verses. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely got no money. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. so let's jump into Black White Boy because to me that song is super powerful, man. That's why I wanted to say this for this one, man. Yeah. Well, that title that is White Black Boy. Oh, White Black Boy. I'm, I'm sorry. And I chose White Black Boy because, like, when I, I grew up in Amityville, that's 80% black kids. And um, obviously any of the white kids that were there that went to school with me were influenced by hip hop and black culture. So, you know, as a joke, it would be like, oh, this, this is like the blackest white boy ever. Right. So I kind of flipped it like, oh, this is the whitest black boy. Ah, OK, OK. Yep, yep. That is thing. And I, plus, I've never seen that phrase actually like put out there like white black boy. No. So I thought that was cool. But um, so was that experiences was that song like personal experiences? Yeah. That was deep. That was hard, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's personal experience. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten it my whole life. Um, well, not my whole life, probably since I was a teenager, since I was like 16, when I first started diversifying my uh, musical taste. Mm -hmm. um, I obviously picked up the lingo and the, and the style. Like, I'm yo, it's so funny that people are wearing Vans right now, because I swear I used to get chewed out for wearing Vans and DCs and all of that. You know what I'm saying? And now <laughs> the world keeps turning. This is crazy. <laughs> but stuff like that, you know, like, uh -huh. like if, I, if I come through with my DC shoes and the new Incubus album and I'm like, what up, dude? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm going to get picked on in Avonville High School. So that was one aspect of it. Then once I um, kind of grew up and just started picking my friends based on character and nothing else. I just ended up with a lot of white friends and they would always joke to me too. Like, Oh, Alex, is not, you're not black. You're, you're, you're not black. You're not really black. Like that's everything. It was out of love. I, I get yeah. it. But at the same time, it's like, I am black regardless as to how I might portray myself or how I carry myself, you know, before I open my mouth. Uh, in fact, I, I would say that I'm more on the intimidating side uh, based on appearance. Cause I'm, you know, I'm a big dude. If I'm carrying a beard at the time, it's like, you probably don't know if I'm friendly or if whatever. So that's just kind of like the complications of that have been my experience as a black person. What, and, do, you uh, that's, what, do, you, what do you like? Six, one, two and change? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm five, I'm five, seven, but I'm stocky. Oh, all right. All right. And so oh, you like, look like much taller from the video. Oh, no, no, no. All right. All right. I guess I should use this camera angle more often. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good tip, bro. <laughs> uh, I know what you mean, though, by the beard thing, though, too, because, you know, it's funny. I get this other line of it because, you know, in the wintertime, I grow, I, where I live is mad cold. All right. I live on top of a mountain. I grow a beard for purpose. I don't grow for an aesthetic. Okay. And I let my beard just grow. I don't groom this thing, man. So by about time, like, February comes, man, I am one bushy mountain guy. Like, yeah, yeah. Right? And I remember – Going and I have, you know, I have a very olive complexion, okay. And going through supermarkets sometimes, you know, I, I, I look intimidating. I look like, you know, I, I, I just, I don't look right. <laughs> right, right. So I remember in some situations where I'll be walking down the aisle and people will literally just, literally turn around out of that aisle, yeah, and get out of there, and I'm like. Well, I'm going to use this to my full advantage, man, because I'm going to run through this store real quick, get everything I need, get yeah. on the line and dip out. <laughs> Word. Yeah, I used to make that joke all the time, man. It's like one of the benefits of being black, all you got to do is throw a hoodie on. And nobody leave you. People will leave you alone if you want to be left alone. You know? <laughs> but uh, I get it, bro. I get it. Trust me, man. I, I've, I've been in Thailand. Oh, wow. You know what I'm saying? I've been in. I've been all across America on tour, and that's happened. Were you in Thailand on the trip with the movers? No. Oh, okay, okay. This was years ago. This was years how, ago. How was Thailand? Incredible. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I went to um, Bangkok uh, and Koh Phan Yang, and I had plans to go to Chiang Mai, but um, they got thwarted because I got robbed. Oh, you got robbed? Well, I shouldn't say robbed. I got Money was stolen from my hotel room. Okay, okay. So, yeah, it's not like I was actually in danger, but... um. Yeah, so I had to cut my trip short. 
So like I went to Bangkok, then I went to Koh Phan Yang, and then um, the plan was to go to Chiang Mai, but once I got, once my money got taken, I had to kind of book out of there early. So I went yeah, to yeah. understandable. But yo, dude, it was incredible, man. Like honestly, okay. So before I joined nonstop to Cairo, I was actually thinking about kind of like not giving up on music, but like taking it, giving it a break for a little while and going back to Thailand and just doing whatever. Wow. Like I was going to save for like six, eight months and I was just going to go back and just, cause I loved it, man. You know? Um, but even so I still had that experience of feeling alienated as a dark skinned person. You know what I'm saying? Like you felt that there. Absolutely. Really? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's one of those experiences that like when you speak about it, sometimes people think you're tripping. Is it? I mean, it is. It is. Do you feel that? In, I've never been to Thailand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you feel that being black in Thailand has a different discrimination than being white in Thailand? Do they do they treat all outsiders with that equal discrimination? No. Really? Not from my experience. Okay. I mean, just think about it, right? Like, Thailand is a big tourist area. Yeah. And the surround the surrounding countries are European. You know, I mean, Thailand is Southeast Asia, but like, you know, you go up far north, you're in Europe, right? So I was meeting Dutch people. I was meeting fin Finnish people. I was meeting Germans. I was meeting all kinds of people, British, um, majority. Oh, it's so cool to, to meet that global culture in one spot, though. It was dope. It was so dope. Like, and it was dope to be black there. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm representing, like, you know what I mean? Like, the black. And for the most part, dude, like, most people I meet are indifferent to it, if I'm being honest. Like, they don't give it. They don't care. Like, it's like, if you're cool or if you're into the same type of stuff, like if you meet a drinker, they're going to like you if you also drink. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The common, common interest. Right. So, I, you know, this is, so this is not a sweeping statement at all, but um, even in Thailand, obviously the majority of people, the majority of people there are going to be from Southeast Asia, but the second majority there is, is white. So it kind of is, it, it, it's like a little, of course, it's kind of like America in that way. So, um, I stood out many times, you know, like I'd be walking down the street. I'd just take that look around that most black people kind of take. And it's like, where well, you kind of scope it out. Am I the only one here? And that would happen, you know? Huh? So I don't think it was the same, but then again, it's like, I mean, I'm not having everyone's experience. I'm only having mine. So that's just my true, limit. True, true. You know what I'm saying? But it is one well, of the I like that you keep bringing that up, by the way, too, because it's not, there's no generalizations here. This is just self experience. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I can only speak confidently on, on what I experience. You know what I mean? And that, because there's too much of that. Like when you talked about social media earlier and just like the sort of vapid vacuum it becomes, I think um, people's talking about things that they have no clue what they're talking about. There's yeah. too much of that as well. And so we think we're living in this like information age and it's kind of like. <laughs> There's a gray area. <laughs> yeah, there's a big gray area. <laughs> yeah. It's like a big yeah. gray black black hole void area. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and in times like this, it's very, very important that people uh stick to what they know if they're gonna if they're gonna speak with conviction. So I try to do that. True. But, um yeah, just for on the white black boy thing, like it's it's that experience I think is unique to certain black people. And like I said, uh, if you feel alienated in a situation, you feel like you're being treated different, something like that, it's hard to communicate that to people and have them believe it. Um, and it's one of the things that motivated me to want to write the song. Because I figured if I can make it entertaining, yeah, um, then it would be a little easier for people to kind of um, give me a chance. You know what I mean? If I say it in anger or if I say it in frustration, then it's kind of like, are you sure this is not just a personal problem and you're just in your own head kind of thing? Huh. But, um, at least that was my, that's the way I thought about it. And so far it seems to have worked because I think people really get what I'm saying. And I think they get that I'm not just talking about my own experience as a black man. I'm generally just talking about judging a book by its cover. Yeah. You know, exactly. or feeling yeah, like, right. you know, yeah. Like feeling like, you know, what people should be doing just because of their ethnicity or whatever, or because they're a man or because they're a woman. Like, you know, I have a line in there that says, uh, you know what I hate, you know, uh, people telling me who to date. People yeah, tell me how to talk or what to do with my face is like you don't you're not making the rules for me. You know, it don't matter what it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, but then again, that's me as a gray area thinker. You know what I'm saying? There's a there's another um, there's another rapper that I'd love to introduce you to. Is a great friend of mine. His name's Alex Fresina, and um, his um, his stage name is Alpha Male. I don't know if you ever heard of him. No. Um, 
he had a similar type of situation. He was adopted when he was a kid to a very affluent white family. And it was very difficult for him to, um, you know, basically just, uh, you know, in his story, which is his music, mm-hmm. you hear him talking about like how his parents, like his friend's parents wouldn't let him hang them hang out, you know, and he's a big dude. He's that six, one, you know, 300 pound dude. So yeah. in high school, he was all, you know, he was bigger than most adults already. And their friends, you know, their friends' parents wouldn't let him hang out. And he didn't know where he fit within within his own society. And uh, really cool guy. And I, I'd love to introduce the two of you guys together because both of you guys are phenomenal rappers. And you guys have stories to tell. You know, that's one of the big things with the industry today is that I think we're missing a lot of integral stories hmm. of, of self-development. You know, hmm. a lot of it is especially on mainstream, you know, you're not hearing a story. You're hearing about product placement, you yeah. know, and endorsement and, yeah. and, and mumbling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, Steve, are you, um, uh, do you mind if I, if I have him throw in the clip? Cause I love, yeah, yeah, play it. I think it's a great time for people to listen in. Yeah. All right. So Steve, you're queued up. Cool. You know the stigma of being an enigma. White black boy syndrome. He's not a nigga. He's not a prep boy either. White black boy syndrome. But my mama says that I gotta think bigger. So I need to forgive him. But if they can't figure out what the boy is all about, fuck him. Why you talk like a white boy? Why you always dating white girls? For a black guy, you're not really tough. Don't you see the gang signs that we throwing up? Ain't you a nigga? Ain't you a thug? Don't you know the meaning of a good mean mug? Don't you wanna act ignorant, belligerent, and bad shit? This nigga so white, we about to blow a gasket. Know what I hate? Motherfuckers telling me who to date. Motherfuckers telling me how to talk. Or telling me what to do with my face. You see, there's black people telling me I sound white. And white people saying I'm intimidating. Why can't these motherfuckers ever get shit right? I'm a godson, no debating. I know that gangsters and hoodlums historically dominate perceptions of the black majority, but I speak with all of the articulate authority of five presidents, so you're kind of boring me. But all the lame discrimination, pressing on me and eating away my patience. The girls mind dead, wanna stay blinded. Look around, it's a whole new nation. Ain't you ever seen a white girl with big booties? You ain't never seen a black mathematician? I ain't trying to make a controversial statement. I'm just saying, man, shit is kind of different. Now listen. Fucking losers. Fucking losers. You and the world through that little scope. So since you'll never be dope, why don't you take this rope and fucking... Uh, it's nigga, it's nigga. I'm in the power position, but just cause I started rapping and I want people to listen Don't mean I wanna spread messages that'll lend you in prison Write a track about drugs or glorifying division And I don't praise the mob, I just record on my job I just be grinding and make a proud woman out of my mom So when ignorant individuals start running their mouth I know for damn sure they don't know what they're talking about But you know the stigma of being an enigma White black boy syndrome He's not a nigga, he's not a prep boy either White black boy syndrome but my mama says that I gotta think bigger, so I need to forgive them. But if they can't figure out what the boy is all about, fuck them. Fuck them. Dude, that song. First off, the song's awesome. You beat it as the shit. That, that best spit at that three-quarter mark, man, was hot. The song's hot. You brought that entertainment value that you wanted to it. And the message yeah. is so strong, man. Yeah, that man. message is so strong. Thank you, bro. Yeah, that's that. Like to me, like when I nailed that song, or when I felt like I had it to where I wanted it, I was like, "All right." It, I don't know. It was one of those moments that really like made me feel like, "All right, I'm on the right track. I think I can pull this stuff off." Because that that song was hard to to produce. I actually had to bring in a friend to help me just uh, balance the beat and the tone and all of that. 
um, to get it to where I wanted it. And then like writing it. So I actually wrote that. Okay. So I actually went to rehab in 2018 uh, for alcoholism. And I wrote that song in there. Wow. The, yeah. Yeah. The wow. day before, yeah. The day before I went in there, I, I gave, I gave this um, Latino woman a cigarette and she was like, why you talk like a white boy? <laughs> it had been so long since I had that happen to me. <laughs> I, I, I was like, wow, I forgot what this is like. <laughs> but it was just on my mind like while I was in rehab. So I wrote that song and I, I obviously I didn't have any music. I would just spit it a cappella to people uh, in my in rehab and they were they all loved it. So I was like, all right, this is dope. Like wow. You know, it's like I can actually like because you know it's like a like I said, like I have these hunches about things and it's like, all right, so I actually can make something entertaining, make it a message, make it concise, make it technically good. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then from there, I started writing pretty much the rest of the album. So that song is actually like, that's the song that, that's the song that created Black Alex, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So do you think that song was a big part of like your therapeutic healing during recovery? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? That alienation really contributed a lot to me drinking as much as I did. Huh? You know and like, the, like, like feeling like I didn't belong, which is something that I struggle with my whole life. Because, like I said, like it's black people saying I'm too white, white people saying I'm intimidating, and it's like, all right, well, where do I fit in? You know what I'm saying? And obviously, like, you know, there's other cultures in between that, but um, it was difficult to figure out my place sometimes. You know what I'm saying? And so I find myself in a place where others have found it difficult to find their place. And they've also been using drugs. And I don't know why. I guess maybe it was on my mind. You know? Um, but I also just wanted to kind of write something that was kind of funny. And I thought that was a good one to write about. You know? There's a lot. Of, there's a lot. That goes into that decision. There was a lot of creativity behind it. I mean, even that album cover was sick i mean you really it dude, dude you put so much thought and and beautiful thought into it yeah thank you for sharing that i mean look at this this is phenomenal yeah. um dude you, you you crushed it with it so when did you release this this came out on june 8th uh, oh you're like super new man yeah super new wow okay maybe it was that two months ago now yeah do you have it on vinyl uh no 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 okay no, it's funny because um okay, so with that question, I don't know if you want to go into like the sustainability yeah and how I relate it to music. All right. No, man, this is your show, man. This is you. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's fire. I like that. <laughs> but um all right, so like I'm gonna just say it straight out. Like yeah. there's a lot of things that artists care about that I used to care about that I do not care about anymore. And I don't and when I say I don't care about them, it's not like I'll reject them. I don't outright reject the option for myself, but I don't stress myself to make certain things happen. All right, I'll show you this vinyl here. So this right here, this is um, this is the last band I was in, Nonstop to Cairo. Oh, wow, okay. This is a vinyl, right? Is that you right in the front? That's me, yeah, that's me on the mirror. Oh, look at that, cool, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I'm, I'm on the mirror, yeah, that's, that's the word. So like this thing, I'm so proud of, and the whole band's proud of it. And we got the opportunity to do it. It was amazing. It was incredible. The fact that it exists makes me very happy. But I haven't made any money off it. And it took like a year of my life. Because I was, I, was, I was the one like uh, working with the vinyl people to design this thing. Oh, wow. It was, it was a lot of extra work, a lot of revisions, a lot to do, right? It hasn't produced anything other than joy. <laughs> wait, wait, ready? So let's weigh that. Let's weigh that. I'm going to jump into this bit, okay? okay? There's a perception in our society today that success is only measured by monetary gain, okay? It's the old Jones mentality of materialistic gain. Right. I feel that it's very important that we have two banks that we always fill, okay? Mm -hmm. We have one bank that is our financial bank. That's to maintain our comfort of lifestyle of, of keeping food on the table, roof over our head and being able to, you know, live in that, in a, you know, in a, even, a, even in a, uh, uh, a modest living. Like I live very modestly, Same. but living comfortably. Okay. Yeah. The other bank though, is your emotional bank. 
Mm. And so many people forget to fill that emotional bank. That album there, to me, is an absolute sign of success on a highest level. And the sure. reason why is it doesn't matter if you didn't make any money on it or not. What it shows is that you put your heart and dedication into that piece for one year. Right. And now you have this physical legacy of showing what this has become. Yes. You know? Yes. And and that's a piece that people all, all often, you know, like they, they forget to, that, to appreciate. Sure. Is those joys. And that joy piece of it, to me, joy and time, to me, is the greatest is the greatest form of success. Yes. You know? And, um, yeah. And it's like for, you know, it's I, the way I feel is like the greatest reward of success is the appreciation of the hard work put in mm -hmm. that album right there. And this album that you just did on June 8th with that album cover and these songs that you put out, I mean, that is success. Absolutely. That is success. You know, now we just need to turn it into a megaphone to build that other bank. Right. Sure. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know what? I get all those feelings when I look at that vinyl. And I think about this time, you know, this band, these guys are my brothers. Like I think about so many different times and so many different stories and the trials and tribulations of putting it together and the fact that we stuck it out. And that's great. I love it for that. You know, is it sustainable though? Can I do that again for the sake of joy? Now, if I got paid to do this, if I made, if I would have made like, I don't know, even a hundred thousand dollars, modestly speaking, uh, and because in the music industry that's a modest number, right? Oh, like, big time. yeah, oh, very modest. Number. Just, yeah. Just filthy rich. So if I made a hundred grand from this time period, even it doesn't even have to be off that album. I feel like the balance of the effort would be more harmonious, right? But like I said. And I, and I can vouch for the rest of the guys when I say this. All we got out of this was the joy of doing it. So I asked myself, through the lens of sustainability, do I need to do that to be happy? Do I need to go through all that to feel satisfied wow. and creative? Yeah. So what? So because this right here, this vinyl, this could easily be a music video. Yeah. This could easily be studio time. Yeah. This could this could easily be a mastering session with a top mastering engineer that's going to charge. You know, eight thousand dollars, and the album's going to sound incredible. But again, like, do I need to do that to feel that joy as a creative person? Because I know I can make money. I mean, I've you know I've been making money. That's how I've been staying alive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, I, know I can fulfill that part. That doesn't have to be attached to my art. True. I, I like think, that. That's huge. Right. Continue. I didn't mean to interrupt, but that was oh, a good. huge statement. I think, I think it took me a long time. And I'm not always there. There's definitely days where I'm still like, you know, old guard. But it took me a lot of time to, to reconcile the idea that like that monetary success may not happen. And I can still be a happy, creative, fulfilled person with a great life in spite of that. And I don't need to engage in anything that I feel is weighing down on me too much. You know, because I'll give you a little more backstory. Um, so that time I spent the rehab, uh, I didn't even go to that hospital for rehab. I, I went to that hospital because I had a nervous breakdown at the end of 2017. Oh, wow. Okay. Heavily fueled by my alcoholism, but an issue independent on itself, right? So that's where I got, from there I got diagnosed bipolar and I've been on lithium um, three times a day since then and a sleep medication. Um, I have, you know, it's a complicated situation with that, but I've been on medication. Um, so while I'm in rehab and the idea of rehab was introduced to me just kind of as like a, like I was telling them like what would trigger me and, and drinking was always part of the equation. So they just suggested that I handle my drinking and I said, fine. Um, so while I'm in there, I'm reflecting on what put me in there, you know, and I know for a fact it was going real hard at trying to get that success. It was going super hard at like shooting the video, sh doing this, doing that, doing that, doing that. You know, if you have the financial means to do these things, it's different. But when you're struggling to make it happen, it's like it feels like a nightmare. And when you're not seeing the result on the other side of the expectation, right. it's demoralizing. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. And I still got to go to work. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so what I would do, my approach 
that year or those years that led up to that breakdown, I mean, I, I became an insomniac from that time period. You know what I'm saying? I was literally the type of person I would get out of work. I would work through the night. I would sleep an hour, two hours, get back up, go to work. You know, I, mean? I would do that for months. Wow. And then I would crash and be depressed for like three months, you know, and still have to work or whatever. So I'm thinking about, all right, I can't keep that pace up. That pace put me in a hospital. So when it comes to creative expression and fulfillment, I, I really, I asked myself, I'm like, all right, it would be cool to do a music video. Like, it would be great if Sasha Gray flew to Long Island and I actually got to shoot a music video with her for my song. That would be amazing. That would be, that would be fresh. That would be everything you want. You know what I'm saying? I'd probably make a lot of money on that video too. Dude, we're going to make that happen. I am going to, I'm going to promise you that we're going to try everything we can to get Sasha Gray to see this. Steve, you guys hear, you hear this, convey this to the movers. Let's start reaching out to Sasha Gray. Let's show her this. Let's make the music video happen. The movement going, I mean, that would see that that's, that's happiness right there. Just to see everyone get behind that and try to make it happen. That would be fire. But at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, yo, I love this song anyway. And it's not like I'm not going to go perform it. It's not like I'm not going to put it out. It's not like I don't want people to hear it. It's not like I'm not proud of it. Mm -hmm. so I'm at a point where that's enough. True. And that's anything cool. else. You found a balance, man. Yeah. I'm that's at a point where that's Because you know what? When it comes to being an artist, and, and just when it comes to being an artist and like making moves and, and, and building an audience, there's a lot of things you don't need to do. And I think the internet age is really showing us that. And I think a lot of local musicians could probably attest to that. Because, I mean, how many local musicians do you know have a high-budget music video? Uh, yeah. Yeah, not yeah. many. But they can still, but they, they still might get the opportunity to do Great South Bay. Exactly. Do the Paramount. Yeah. And these are all gigs I've done. And it's like, all right, I did those things. They were great times. Like, I, you know, I'm up there with my bros, and it's like, you know, I can I can have fun and 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 connect with people just posting content online. And I'll shoot a music video. It's just I'll do it with my iPhone because that, that, you know what I'm saying? I'll do it that way and uh, make sure the editing is dope or something like that if I feel like it, you know? To put it in simple terms, for me, and this is not for everybody, and I get that because we all have different ambitions, but for me, the most sustainable thing that I can do as an artist is to do what I want to do. Yeah. Do what I do. Even, when, even when George Floyd, when George Floyd uh, passed, mm -hmm. I... I um, it's, it sort of activated the political side of my mind, which I never usually engage in that public discussion, but I just I just took started taking part in it for whatever reason I was compelled to. I even put it out there to people. I was like, um, if you want to do a collaboration album, if you want to do a forum, if you want to do anything like that related to black lives or, or the, the black movement or anything like that, I'm falling back off that. I'm falling back off pretty much everything right now because I was so compelled by this situation. And, and 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 stating my piece on that, Alex from three years ago would have been wrestling in his mind: Do I do, do I want to sacrifice my career to speak the truth? Do I want to do I do I want to alienate people just to say yeah. you know what I'm saying? But now it's a super simple decision for me. It's like, nope, this is what. And bro, this happened a week before the album came out. Wow! So that was like a week. Of, I had a whole thing planned to promote, but I'm like, I'm not gonna be talking about my album with this going on right now, like. So I made the decision to, to to follow my heart and do what I wanted to do. And I can make that decision every day. And as I grow and I and I learn what decisions are better for me, I'm naturally going to make better decisions. But when it comes to pressure, when it comes to expectations, when it comes to competition, when it comes to jealousy, when it comes to uh, um, sacrifice and all that stuff, I, I, I'm not about that no more. I'm not about that no more. To me, that that that's what drove me nuts. And I'm like, I'm at a point where if I don't find the kind of success that I might have wanted when I first got in the game, I'm okay with that. You know what I mean? Like I try to I try to reinforce that in my mind. You know, and I love that you're saying that right now because I I personally know a lot of artists that they've given up on their dream of art because they didn't make it. Um, to the expectation of the monetary success that they thought of. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I've seen them lose a piece of themselves by not maintaining staying creative. And then all of a sudden you get those random weird moments that it's like, you know, all of a sudden that guitarist gets that guitar back in his hands just because you're just hanging out one day and, you know, and there was a guitar there and there was an amp there and he plugged it in. 
and he starts going and all of a sudden you just see his happiness there. Yeah. And it's like, you don't need to quit doing that because you're not reaching, you know, expectations. You do it because that's your, your passion. You, you know, it's your want and your love with me. I've been doing, nun- I don't know why the hell I've been doing nunchucks for 20 plus years. I'm nasty at them. I'm like a nunchuck master now. No joke. But like, but I'm not making a dime on nunchucks. All I'm doing is hurting my body sometimes. <laughs> Worry, bro. Yeah, but yeah, I get, yeah, that's real passion. It's like, you're literally taking those hits for the love. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know like that's all you need. And if you're fulfilled, man, see, the thing is with artists, we love art because it was rebellious, right? Like, like I was raised in the church. So when I saw, you know, I was wearing a suit every Sunday. And anytime I saw live music, it was musicians in suits singing yeah. about God. Yeah. When I saw Mace rapping on TV with a chain and the shorts and the uptowns and the fitteds, you know what I'm saying, with the waves, he looked like a rebel to me. He looked like he was going against the grain. You know what I'm saying? Creating mm-hmm. his own way. And, you know, obviously there's like a, he was, you know, there's an industry component to all that, to orchestrate that image. But as a kid, that's how I perceived it. Why do I like Batman? He's a vigilante. He's a hero. He does what he wants. He's, he follows his heart. He does what's right. Puts himself at risk. But then when I grew up and decided to actually become a musician, then I saw all of a sudden I fell in line. You know, huh. then all of a sudden yeah. it was like, now I'm having conversations with promoters and they're talking about exposure. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do whatever I want. I whatever I gotta do for exposure. And it's like, you'll bust your ass trying to get tickets to a show. Not that there's anything wrong with this, you know what I'm saying? If that's if that's where you're at, that's where you're at. But this is the experience I had. You'll bust your ass trying to sell these tickets to a show. And maybe the show's successful, maybe it's not. But once that night is over, it's over. The promoter made a bunch of money. You made maybe a little bit, and then it's yep. like, okay, you kind of feel like you got suckered a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like, damn, like, if I brought all the people, why can't I be the one making most of the bread? Or why can't I be the one, you know what I'm saying, like, more in charge kind of thing? You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you start to feel, at least for me, you start to kind of feel like you, you're not in control. Like, people, like, everyone else's, their suggestions and the fear that they instill in you, that's what's in control. So if someone sells you exposure, the implication is you're not going to get exposure. <laughs> if you don't do this thing, but that's not rebellious at all. That's not the spirit of what got me into music at all. And like I said, it's not for everyone, but for me, if we're talking about sustainability, if we're talking about joy, if we're talking about longevity, to me, it's much simpler to just lose the fear of losing nice. and yes. embrace the opportunity to do, to just, create my own world, my own universe, and, and add my own ideas to the lexicon of Western music, Western art. You know what I'm saying? Like, even if it's just on the local level, even if only my homies see it, you know what I'm saying? Like, only, like, like anyone who's heard my album, I think I, I think I have less than a thousand streams on a whole album on Spotify, right? So that's less than a thousand people that are, on, that are aware that Black Alex also has something to say. And that's fine, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's fine, because... I know I'm not compromised on that. I know I did what I wanted to do. I put in the work. I put it out when I was ready. You know, it, it was no, there was no pressure. There was none of that. And it felt, it felt better. Like I played that at the Paramount three times nonstop. It, it, this felt better than that. And that was a big deal. Yeah. This felt better than that. And it's like, and, it, and it's, it's relatively quiet compared to a situation like that. But that's in that stillness. It's like, Man, <laughs> you know what I mean? Then I, then I was like, I was so happy with the feedback from this album. I'm about to drop one on Friday. I don't even know if you knew that. I'm about no, to drop no, I didn't. That's amazing. Yeah. Are I'm you about really? drop, I'm about to drop a mixtape on Friday, man. Like, Get out of here. What's it called? Um, Black Alex Raps. It's an acronym. The acronym stands for uh, Reflections and Positive Sonnets. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Yo, nice. if you're on my Instagram page, you, yeah, I've, been, I've been posting about it a little bit. But um, that's not something that is like wise to do by traditional standards. Like you just released the album. I worked on that album for two years. I wrote 40 songs for that album. Those six songs are the ones that I just feel fit the best together. And that's where I put out. That was two years of my life and I put it out. And I could have been heartbroken with the response. I could have been like, man, it's not enough numbers. It's not enough, it's not enough. But instead I was just satisfied. And now I'm gonna just keep doing it. And um, me, that's a sustainable approach. You know what I'm saying? It's like. 
I don't have to hold myself back because I just put an album out. Because as the kind of creative person I am, it's like, but I want to put, I want to drop this, I want to drop this, and I might have my manager telling me, no, 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 you don't want to drop that because you know you just put this out and blah blah blah. It's like, nah, man, I want the freedom. Yeah. I want the freedom to do what I want to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I'm just gonna do it, and I have that choice now to just do it. You know, um, like I said, three years ago, I wouldn't have done it. I would have felt like, well, I just dropped this album, and I want to promote it, and I want to make it something real happen. But if I didn't have the money to make it happen, I would get upset. And if people weren't responding, I would get upset. I would start to feel like a failure, right? Because that's that comes with the territory of being an artist. You want to affect people, and if it's not happening, you start to feel like a failure. Huh? So, I'm 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 trying more and more to get rid of that part of me that is like willing to pour myself out True, yeah. <laughs> for for anything. You know what I'm saying? For anything, because that because I've already been in a situation where that legitimately put me in a hospital. Yeah, exactly. I, I I've experienced it firsthand. So like, when someone tells me, "Hey, you should drop a sick video and do this," I'm like, "Yeah, you know what? If I had the money to do that, I would do that, but I'm not gonna." Because not dropping the video or doing something else instead is uh, less stressful for me, and leaves my mind clear to work on raps and beats, which is really the bottom line. You know what I'm saying for me? So I don't know. I kind of went off on a tangent there, but I think- No, dude, this is an important tangent though, because you know what? There's probably a lot of people that are listening in that feel very similar as to that. It, it's a balance, man, you know? And you found that balance piece of letting go of the unnecessary pressures that all too often feel like they're- they're essential pressures when they're not, you know, when you can let go of that, you can live, you can breathe that to me that, you know, I used to live in New York. I live on top of a mountain in Pennsylvania. The weight of the world just was gone. And I'm like, wow, I could breathe. I never felt this before. I had no idea what this felt like. Yeah. And, um, you know, like, what, what kept you in New York though? What was the tie family? Okay. I'm an old school Guinea man. So I got like 300 extended family members within 15 minutes. And every Sunday oh. was at grandma's house. Oh, God. So <laughs> right, 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 right. So, you know, to do that, you know, there was so much guilt from my family of moving, but they knew that I had to, it just, they, they saw that I was, I couldn't, I just couldn't deal with the constant just pace of, the Jones's mentality was driving me nuts. The the toxic environment of just traffic and you know just you know everyone every you know to me this is how my mind saw it is everyone just felt very self entitled like it was it was either take or be taken mm -hmm. environment you know like when I'm driving on the highway like when I go back to New York now I'm chilling driving down this the, this you know this highway cruising. The second I hit the GWB, it's like, all right, I got to turn my New York back on. Right. And it's like, take or be taken at that point. It's like, yo, if don't try to cut me off because I'll just turn right into you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, man. Yo, that competitive. I had to get out. I had to get out. It was making that's me. Incredible. Dude, that, sh that shit, it seeps into so many aspects of our lives. And I know it's in music. I like, I know we don't, we don't want to be driven by competition as artists. Like we love each other and we want to just support each other. But at the end of the day, there's only so many gigs. Yeah. It's only so many, so many ears. It's a cannibalizing yeah. industry, man. It is, man. And it's like that pressure, bro. Like I li like I literally like like musically speaking, career wise, I done moved to Pennsylvania too. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm chilling in a cabin right now. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> And whenever someone tells me, "Hey, you got to take the GW uh, George Washington," I'm like, "Do I though?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I, uh, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? It's so. it's um you know what's what I'm trying to do with the mission of Kush is you know again on the acronym of Kush of keeping us sustainably healthy. Okay, it's bringing in that collective together, bringing in that audience and the content creators. You know, both from education, from experts of sustainability into um, musicians, into film creators and building building a cluster together, a community together that's really self-supporting of each other. Uh, 
And that to me is the, that to me is the way the few, I mean, look, COVID is kind of expediting all this, man. It's amazing. I'm sitting back and if you don't collaborate, you're losing out. I don't, I don't care. I don't give a shit who you are, what you say. If you're not collaborating and building into a multi multifaceted project, right. you're not going to be able to survive, man. This is, we're being expedited into an evolution of business right now. Mm -hmm. You're either going to evolve quickly or you're going to die. And that's simple. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So the way I'm seeing this now is that we tie in, let's get the sustainability experts together. Let's pick a single theme of topic. Like July, it's all about life underwater. Bam, the anchor. Let's create a singularity of a movement together. Beach cleanup, per, you know, for example, okay? And now let's get the musicians together. And hey, musicians, we're going to pump you out. We're going to become that megaphone, okay? But at the same time, when you're not talking about your music, let's talk about these actual tangible scientifically proven sustainable action items that we could be working with together because yeah. you know how to influence your followers better than our voice can sure. because, because you know you're their role model they yeah. follow you for a reason they like you you know so now we bring the music and the sustainability and the corporate tie all together and we create a single moving item a singularity and that's what that's what we're trying to do here with Kush is creating that singularity of a community support system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, on that, that's a great, great, great way to look at it. And honestly, like, I kind of hope, I kind of hope that's where the world's going. Where it's like, listen, if you're if you're if you're on that like overly competitive thing, like you kind of, I don't know, you're not going to survive in this new environment because we've all realized that we need each other. You know. Um, it's funny you mentioned the um, celebrity influence on social media before, and um, I got to thinking the other day, man, because you know, with all this like different controversies coming out about like human trafficking and stuff like that, there's a lot of people where it's like, yo, man, I'm ready to disavow anybody, anytime if I find that they're involved in anything like that. Oh yeah, right? Because that you're absolutely not a role model at that point. But it got me thinking. It's like, yo, I know enough artists to where I really don't have to listen to nobody famous. No. You know it's what I mean? I know exactly. enough graphic designers, like I don't gotta, you know what I'm saying? I don't gotta go to no company. Mm -hmm. So as we are any musicians that are listening to this, or as we as we move into the future and we're trying to keep things sustainable and we we don't want our career to drive us into misery or make us bloodthirsty, um, yeah, man, start collaborating with each other. Absolutely. Like, like it's like if I know if you hit me up. Uh, for a mix, some engineering or some graphic art, like I'm not gonna be like charging an arm and a leg. Like I'm like I'm more invested in helping you see your vision come through and helping that, helping that, and being a part of it than I am to try to make a quick buck or try to like upcharge you because I know you're a new artist or something like that. So definitely, let's rely on each other more. You yeah. know what I mean? Like let's promote each other more. And this is advice that I need to take as well. You know because. You know, we all still get caught up in our own in our own schedules and stuff. But, yo, man, if people got shows, if people got uh, live um, um, uh, broadcast, broadcast, yeah, and then, I got you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> but, uh, let's be a part of that. Let's let's support each other, man. Like, you know, because the Long Island music scene is us. You know what I mean? And I know big bands get invited here to all the time because it's just, you know, it's a capitalist world and that's just makes sense to do. And that's fine. No beef. But in the meantime, we should really be trying to lift each other, lift each other up as much as possible, man. Share each other's music. You know, uh, don't just scroll past someone who just released something. Let's exactly. check it out. Give them that encouragement. Cause sometimes that's better than the money. You know what I mean? Cause sometimes people just want to know that they created something dope. Sometimes people want to know that their, their skills are valuable. You know, so if if it comes if it's like a communal thing that we're starting to aim for, I mean that's definitely sustainable because it's like as long as the passion is there to keep creating, we could do that till we're dead, and we don't got no pressure from no no powers that be that we're not doing good enough. So we're not do we're not dealing with that complexity in our minds. You know what I'm saying? That negative self talk or that self judgment where you're comparing yourself to your idol. It's like nah, man, you don't got to compare yourself to idol. Compare yourself to your last record. Cause I'm waiting for it. You know what I'm saying? Cause your friends are waiting for it. Cause like the homies in town are waiting for it. You know what I'm saying? So. 
I'm going to give you an analogy that I like to use. And I think, I think you'll appreciate this from, and this describes everything you just said. I look at this community. I look at Kush as a tree. Okay. And in order for the tree to grow big and beautiful, it needs the right nutrients in the ground, in the soil. That's where it all starts. Okay. And the way I see those nutrients is I see those nutrients as content, mm. true, passionate content. So we feed the tree as it goes, starts going up the trunk. It's that team of Kush that helps to organize it. So the community has direction. And then as it goes out into the branches and those flowers bloom, it's up to us all, not just as the individual content creator, but all the content creators and all of the audience to pollinate. We're pollinators. Mm. Our goal is to build other beautiful trees so we could all grow and thrive as this, as a larger community. But if we don't pollinate this tree, what happens to the tree? It's going to be this lone tree sitting by itself, figuring out, well, where's my place in the world? And we're all those trees and we're all planting seeds, but now we can start putting those nutrients in together as a whole, as a collective to keep spreading these big, beautiful trees. Absolutely. bro. So that's tremendous. Dude, I yo, you were a phenomenal guest, man. You're a kick ass. You, I want you on this thing again. I want, <laughs> I, I want, yo, dude, I, I want to be in the music video with Sasha Gray as well. So we got <laughs> <laughs> so um I think this is a good high point that we can kick off. Yeah, yeah. This is your show. You leave everyone off with the, with the last statement. Give everyone a one big last statement, and then uh yeah, and then we'll uh kick out. All right. Um yeah, in general, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Um, if you have goals, chop them down into small goals first. That's how you reach larger goals. Try not to do more than one or two things a day, you know? Uh, and just, like, be free and don't have fear that if you let go of what doesn't serve you, that you're not going to be okay because you will be okay. In fact, you might find that you thrive even more once that weight is off you. Uh, Beautiful, man. That was perfect, man. Yeah. And I, and everyone who's listening, damn it. Open your goddamn ears. I'm just saying that like straight up, like li yeah. listen, take it in, absorb it, self reflect on who you are and be, get involved, get involved in the community, get involved with your friends, call your friends and say, yo, let's go do something. Turn it into yeah. an activity of just doing better and being better. Um, I want to thank black Alex. Thank you, dude. You're yeah. awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, so we're going to close out this episode of Sustainable You. This is awesome on a high note. So thank you for joining us on the Sustainable You podcast. Charlie Moore here with Kush. We're out. Later, guys. Peace. <laughs>